Welcome everyone. Uh, this is a meeting of the um, Board of Health for Northampton. Today is January 18th, 2024. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, we'll start before the actual opening of the meeting with public comment session. Uh, is there anyone here who would like to speak in public for public comment? You'd have two minutes to speak. Um, I know I can't see you because your videos are turned off. So if you could please use your um, reactions button to raise your hand or wave or something. I see Gabrielle. Um, Suzanne, would you do us the pleasure of timing? Certainly. Uh, Gabrielle, you may unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Can I begin my comment or? You may go, you may start. Hey. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you everybody for all the work that you do uh, before I even get started. Uh, you know, uh, public health is uh, near and dear to my heart and I I'm, I'm glad you're you're all there um, doing this difficult work. Uh, I came today because I just wanted to uh, make a, a brief comment on the uh, the kratom that's on the old business um, and its use in general and, and what goes on out there. Just to briefly say, I'm a community health worker I'm the servant director of an organization called the Folding Chair Project, and we seek to advocate for people who use drugs, people in recovery, and on a host of matters. And I could say personally, as you know, someone who's been a community health worker, worked in syringe service programs, that it's a, a really uh, well well used and uh, very low barrier tool for folks who for pain management, for uh, home detoxing, for people who want to have a medication for opiate use disorder other than suboxone or methadone for whatever reason. Um, I've seen it safely used and um, I really worry that uh, some of the evidence out there suggesting that it's extremely dangerous or what have you uh, isn't very particular, you know, isn't very granular and is, is somewhat subjective. I sent an email out yesterday to the uh, email address on there. I was hoping that my email could be entered into the record uh, and folks would read it. I offered a uh, a few citations here and there, and I, I'm, I'm happy to offer more and to talk at length at, at the subject on the subject anytime. But I do really feel it's a tool I see used quite often for folks, um, low barrier, and there aren't a lot of tools for folks out there. Thank you very much. Joanne, I don't see anyone else for public comment at this time. Uh, there's a Dan. Uh, there is one other person I don't recognize. Right. Is there anybody else here for public comment? Please that use the reaction Dan button. From prevention. Oh, Let's... gotcha. Dan is thumbs up. What does that mean? Uh, our new substance use prevention director. Okay. <laughs> I just uh... made co host, Dan, so you can <laughs> take yourself off camera. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to change my name and title in here, so. That's okay. I'll do it for you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, is there, so there's no one else here for public comment. Okay, we'll close the public comment session. Um, and then um, is there a motion to open the meeting, the formal meeting of the Board of Health? Move to open. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion, comments? All in favor? Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Uh, I'll just say to tonight, um, uh, this whole meeting is being recorded, and tonight all board members are present, including. Um, uh, Dr. Cynthia Swopis, Dr. Suzanne Smith, um, Janet Grant, Dallas Dukar, and myself, Joanne Levin. Um, okay, we are going to start um, with some introductions of the staff. I um, just want to say later in the agenda, we were going to have Michelle Ferry um, talk about um, the, um, the DHSS, sorry, the DCC, um, but she is out sick tonight, so we are not going to be doing that. So uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, she's very ill. Michelle's always one to show up. 
Um, so she's really got to be just feeling awful if she can't make tonight's meeting. But she said that she'll put it on her um, calendar to attend March's meeting. Great. All right, take it away. So first on our list tonight, we have um, our inspection team and Angelica Sanchez is one of our newly hired regional health inspectors. Angela, would you take a few moments to introduce yourself, let the board know how long you've been with the DHHS and uh, some of your roles and responsibilities that you're doing here, maybe some background that uh, brought you here. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, hopefully you can. I'm Ange, new regional health inspector with the DHHS here in Northampton. Um, I've been with the department for around six months now, and I did not come with any prior food or housing experience. So over the last couple of months, I've just been getting acclimated to shadowing inspections and getting as much training under my belt as necessary. Um, and just looking forward to new experiences and getting some more knowledge under my belt. A welcome addition to the team. Welcome. <laughs> JJ, you're up, our next regional inspector. Hi, I'm JJ. Um, I started in December, so I've been doing a lot of training, a lot of modules and test taking and shadowing. Um, I came from like, uh, I did some healthcare stuff with phlebotomy the last four years. I did radon testing prior to that, and I've just worked in many restaurants and things over the years but I've got a lot to learn. Excited about it. Thanks. Great. Welcome. Okay, our next is Kristen. She is actually the city of Northampton inspector. So we have four inspectors, two for the region, which is part of our PHE collaborative. And then we have two city of Northamptons. Kristen is the second of two. Donna Bowman, who you've all met before, is our other city of Northampton inspector. Kristen, you're up. Hi, I'm Kristen Hargrave Modio. Um, I have been here a little under three months. Been working on training, the same as these guys, kind of just going out there doing some inspections. Um, my previous experience was I was a quality insurance manager for a company called Restaurant Associates, uh, based out of Harvard Business School, and I did some regional inspecting there. Great, great, welcome. And I'm happy to say that our inspection team is full. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> All right, thank you. Um, next on our list, we have Daniel O'Donohue, who is our Substance Use Prevention Director. Daniel, you're on. Great, thank you. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel O'Donohue, and I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of my background and experience and how it's relevant to leadership positions and how it prepared me for the role um, of Director of Substance Use Prevention. Um, my experience in leadership um, has been over 20 years of working in public health in various fields, including uh, domestic sexual intimate partner violence, working with LGBTQ youth, uh, working at AIDS Action Committee in uh, Boston, Massachusetts as uh, the director of the program called Transcend, and also as um, the supervisor of the needle exchange program in uh, AIDS Action's pharmacy and drop-in center. Um, I have also been, um, I have a master's in education in social justice education from UMass Amherst. And for the last eight years, uh, prior to my position here, I've been a health educator um, in East Hampton Public Schools and also in Hadley Public Schools. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And welcome. Thank you. And next we have M. M, are you able to show your video? No, got you. Sorry about that, Em. Sorry, I hope you didn't hear me swear there. Um, <laughs> no, but you can put your video on now. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I'm Em Rhodes Moulton. I'm the new Northampton Public. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're frozen, Em. You froze them. Oh, did you did you get any of that by any chance? No. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Am I okay now? More stable. Okay. So I'm M. Rhodes Moulton, new public health nurse for Northampton. Very excited to join the team. Joined in December. 
Um, my background is in um, substance use, harm reduction, and community health. And um, thank you so much for having me. Great. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. And I'm happy to say we just recently hired um, our fourth nurse who will be starting on February 5th, Amy. And her name is Jennifer D. Help me out. Jennifer Denkowitz. Denkowitz, thank you very much. And that will make a full public health nurse team. We'll have two regional public health nurses and two city of Northampton public health nurses. So we're very excited about that. So thank you all for coming on tonight. Introduce yourselves. Um, board members, do you just want to do about a two minute intro to who you are and your background so they know as well who they're working with? Anybody, any volunteers to start? I'll start if you want. Sure. Um, I'm Janet Grant. I um, am retired now, but I worked my whole career in public health in Western Massachusetts. I worked for 17 years for, well, it changed names several times, but it was the Western Mass Center for Healthy Communities. I've worked for the American Cancer Society. I, um, my last seven years, I taught public health and developed the Certificate for Community Health Workers at Holyoke Community College. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Cynthia? Uh, yeah, hi, welcome everybody. So nice to have you with us. Um, I'm Cynthia Swopis. I am um, a retired UMass professor teaching health communication. Um, prior to that, I was in administration at Bay State Health Systems. Um, and then while I was getting my doctorate at UMass, I had the pleasure of working at the Board of Health uh, with policy, or the Department of Health at the time, with policy on tobacco and smoking cessation. And um, I remember when people smoked in bars and restaurants. So we um, we were a forerunner in Northampton, one of the first cities in the, in the Commonwealth to do that. Um, and I'm currently on the Board of Trustees for Cooley Dickinson Hospital. So welcome. Uh, Suzanne? Hi, Suzanne Smith. I'm a physician with a background in public health, infectious diseases a long time ago. I uh, worked in Atlanta at CDC for 22 years. And I've been on the Board of Health, I believe, 14 years. 14 or I think it may be 15 years in March. Um, yes, I'm still here. <laughs> and um, about 10 years ago, I decided to make a career shift. And now I work in addiction medicine in Greenfield. Thank you. Dallas? Hey, my name is Dallas. My pronouns are she and hers. Uh, I have been on the board for about two years now, I believe around. Uh, COVID time is strange, uh, mm -hmm. but it was post COVID. And um, I am also the CEO uh, at Trans Health, uh, where we provide gender affirming care uh, to many different folks. And um, other than that, I am a uh, nurse practitioner by training, and I uh, teach at a bunch of schools. And as you can see, I also have a dog here too. <laughs> Beautiful dog. Thank you. Uh, I'm Joanne Levin. I'm the chair of this lovely Board of Health, and I have been uh, a physician at Cooley Dickinson for somewhere around 35 years now um, and trying to work my way out to retirement. Uh, I'm an infectious disease doc, and I mainly have taken care of uh, patients with HIV. And <clears throat> in the hospital, I do uh, infection control and prevention. Um, I think that's it for now. Anybody have any questions? So great. I'd like to thank my staff for coming on tonight, staying a little extra and making the time for these introductions. At some point, we always ask our teams or staff to come back and talk about their work. But at this point, I just wanted you, you to meet the board and the board to meet you. So I think everyone, you're all welcome to stay if you have a free hour and a half, um, you're more than welcome. But otherwise, I definitely need M to stay and Daniel to stay and 
Taylor didn't introduce herself because you've met her on several occasions, but also uh, Taylor and Amy need to stay as well. Oh, and Kelly, you don't get out of this either. <laughs> so anyone else who wants to leave, feel free at any time, but again, you're welcome to stay. Thanks for coming. All right, so next on the agenda, we have M. you're up. M's gonna present tonight on what we're seeing uh, locally on COVID, influenza, and RSV. All right, sorry, I think, um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, I'm representing the whole nurse team. We collectively worked on this um, updated document. So I'm just gonna review here what I have for you. So firstly, we're gonna take a look at national activity. So it's good to start with a quick look at national trends. So currently flu and COVID levels remain elevated nationally, but after increasing for weeks, the rapid increases are slowing and rates are stabilizing. RSV activity remains elevated nationally, but rates have started decreasing. In Massachusetts, the DPH dashboard is showing that the influenza severity rate is high currently, and Massachusetts is reporting 4.8% of visits to providers are due to flu-like symptoms, down from 6.2% last week. And this is lower from last year at this time. The COVID ED visit level is currently moderate and COVID hospital admission level is also medium. So looking at the DPH dashboard, the COVID cases have been trending up, but have been stable for the past three weeks. Deaths were up for one week, two weeks ago, but remain about 32 per week since early October. That's th 32 in Massachusetts? Um, I'm not sure. I'll have to get back to you on that. I'll have to get back to you on that, Janet. Um, specifically in Northampton, we ran some MAVEN reports for the flu in Northampton, and we understand that it does not capture all cases, but it does give us information. So flu cases in November of 2023 were seven, flu cases in December um, in Northampton were 34, and flu cases so far in January are 14. So currently, the Northampton flu is affecting all age groups, but age groups groups 5 to 10 and 55 to 60 have been the highest number of reported cases. In regards to wastewater, um, we, we do look at wastewater, and that is one important key indicator of COVID in the community and the earliest indicator of transmission, although the levels cannot be exactly correlated with cases. Oops. Hand me froze through our BioBot and DPH. The reports from Northampton have been trending up and reached a high two weeks ago, but now have fallen. It is too early to see if this is a trend. Our numbers reflect the entire Northampton community. For example, Cooley Dickinson Hospital is in our catchment area and therefore very ill community members are reflected. Our concentration values are consistent with neighboring communities and Massachusetts as a whole. I'm in sorry, Massachusetts, and, yes. uh, you had frozen a minute ago. You're talking about COVID in wastewater? Yes, yes. Okay. And that the trend was that it was going up and then it's starting to go down currently. Um, in regards to vaccination rates, um, in Massachusetts specifically, vaccination against the flu is 37.9%, but COVID is only half of this, and it is much lower at 19%. Um, that leads into the DHHS vaccine clinics, just to give you an update on that. We started vaccine clinics in September and still have clinics scheduled to the end of this month. The link for them is on our webpage at northamptonma.gov. And as of today, we have vaccinated at 34 sites with our regional community partners, a total of 3,120 doses, COVID vaccine, 1,506, 226 to pediatric patients, 
The flu vaccine, 1,614 administered, 254 pediatric patients. And COVID and flu vaccines are available at our upcoming council chamber clinics on January 24th and January 31st, 3 to 5 p.m. And we also continue to provide vaccinations through our homebound program. Our current um, DHHS offerings, we have masks for community members, both surgical and N95s, as well as uh, we just got a new shipment in of COVID tests that they do work on the circulating JN1 and those expire in March of 2024. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, for whom are those uh, test kits um, tailored? Who, where are they supposed to go? Can anyone walk in and get some? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is, is there a limit to the number? Because people will ask me. Not at all. And we distribute oh. to all of our partner organizations as well. We're constantly giving them to MANA, um, uh, Survival Center, anyone who requests them, the churches, they can get them. Currently, right now, the schools are having issues getting them, and they'd like them as well. They can't order through the same systems that we do, so. So we should, we should really um, su suggest to people that, that those are, you're using those already for certain communities that are short and having difficulty ordering them, or anybody can walk in. Yep, either and or. Them. Anyone can request them. We'll replenish. Um, that's not a problem. What's not free anymore are the vaccines. Right. So when it was an emergency, a state of emergency, the vaccines, all the COVID vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna were free to us. But now that it's not a state of emergency, we have to purchase them and they're awfully expensive. And you might be able to validate this or Kelly, I think they're like a hundred and some odd dollars per dose. Yeah, so that hurts. And we only get about $36 back in administration fee. So um, if people have insurance, you ask for their insurance. Mm -hmm. And if yep. people don't have insurance, you'll still administer. Oh, now you're frozen. Uh, Joanne, yes, we do still administer. Okay, okay great. And how about, are we at the senior center as well with the tests they distributed there? Yes, I've been distributing at the Northampton um, Senior Center during the community nursing hours, Thursdays, 11 to 12. Hey, Em, I'm interested in what kind of questions or what kind of interest you get at the senior center. What are you doing there mostly? You're muted. Sorry, great <laughs> question. So um, I do blood pressure checks. Um, I do have people drop in and ask me um, general health related questions. I've been uh, supporting a community member who's come for the past four weeks in a row, um, wanting some uh, support with like a toe infection, um, give passing out the COVID tests. And um, today I engaged in conversation about like preparing um, for the cold weather as an older adult. So uh, signs and symptoms of hypothermia, and um, what people's plans were for the weekend to avoid um, cold exposure. Great, thank you. I have Another a couple of questions. Uh -huh. um, are you seeing any masking at the senior center, just voluntary masking or not? And if so, how much? I would say most people are not masked at the senior center and it's voluntary if they do want to wear one. Um, I do mask when I go to the senior center myself. Uh, and the, the latest vaccine that is for, is it the one that came out, I think in like September, is that directly um, is for JN1? Is that what you're saying? That, that that's the latest strain is JN1? Is that what it's called? Yeah, as far as I understand, and I'm still in the onboarding training phase, um, that the 2023-2024 formulary does protect against JN1. That is the current strain. 
Um, I don't know if that's what's been captured in the vaccine, but it has showed to protect against the JN1. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. It wasn't made from that strain, but it cross reacts and cross protects. Any other questions for M? Thank you so much for coming. What a nice yeah, thorough thank report. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Great. Um, next, we have Taylor McAndrew from Hampshire Hope. Thanks for coming, Taylor. Yeah, so, thanks, thanks for having me. So we invited Taylor here today to talk about two but connected topics. We're gonna talk a little bit about the opioid resettlement funds. And then Taylor is also gonna give um, some information on uh, overdose prevention sites. So just if you're not aware, um, a couple of years ago, the um, there was a settlement between the federal government and, and pharmaceutical distributors um, who were the major players in creating the opioid epidemic. And our attorney general's office at that time committed um, providing 40% of the settlement funds to be allocated to municipalities for prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery. Um, in Northampton, the uh, mayor's office decided that those funds were going to go, we were going to be in charge of the funds and how to disseminate them. Um, the AG's office expects that, um, you know, abatement funds should incorporate community input from those directly affected by the opioid epidemic. So Taylor has been the convener on putting a survey together with other Hampshire County community members and is going to talk about that survey and then go into the OPC, pre OPC presentation. So thank you, Taylor. Yeah, thanks, Meredith. Great overview. Um, any other questions before I begin diving into things? No. Okay, great. So I will start just giving more of a verbal overview of where the coalition has been at in terms of the opioid settlement funds. And I guess I'd like to start off just saying I'm mostly going to be talking about a countywide effort, but that it's interesting as being part of the city's Department of Health and Human Services. You know, we're also very tied into Northampton specific work. So if you have questions on either end, I might be able to answer them. Um, what ended up happening was, a you know, quite a few months ago, we started receiving questions, particularly from smaller communities and our, our more rural communities in Hampshire County of what are these funds? We're not quite sure what we're supposed to be doing with them. Um, who's making the decisions? So, you know, in some communities, prevention coalitions exist or you have passionate folks about the topic and they don't know, do we go to the select board? Is it the mayor? Is it the board of health? And so um, Hampshire Hope started kind of trying to pull together answers to these questions, doing presentations. And a common theme that came up was how do we decide what to do with the money? And um, I was a bit of a squeaky wheel probably annoyed some folks, but really kept saying like, we need to slow down and we need to talk to community members. And particularly, as Meredith mentioned, the attorney general really laid out that you should be elevating the voices of people with lived or living experiences, those who have been directly impacted by the opioid epidemic. That's why we're receiving these funds in the first place. So, um, you know, with working with some regional partners, we pulled together what I've been calling an ad hoc work group. Um, there are folks who have been longtime partners of Hampshire Hope, and then also some newer partners. And this was um, with thanks to some of the infrastructure, the public health excellence and shared services work has brought about. So that created a great avenue for myself to be able to meet and work with folks from different boards of health Again, some of these smaller communities that I was not in constant communication with. So on this work group, we have representation from Chesterfield, the Foothills Health District, and West Hampton. We have um, public health directors from Amherst, East Hampton, South Hadley. We have two, I would call them survey experts, but people who um, have done some, some survey creation in the past. One being from Spiffy, who is the um, you know regional dis 
group who sends out the youth health surveys to the schools. Um, and then we have some youth prevention folks as well. We've been working on a survey. Our first step was looking at cities who have already sent out surveys. So Boston was a big one. Um, Medford, Greenfield sent out a survey. So we did some kind of homework compiling of things we liked and didn't like, um, and then worked from there. Uh, again, myself being out of the city of Northampton, we had the pleasure of working with Qualtrics, which is a survey tool. And so this was something that we, you know, promised to our partnering communities that I would be able to go in, do all the back end work, but that we can share this survey out regionally. And that's where I think I'd like to now shift focus, which is um, we're pretty unique in that we're approaching the survey from a countywide perspective and not just a town or city specific perspective. Again, I think it's something to be a, a high point because of where the state is really working to, to shift for shared services, um, being able to potentially have smaller communities pool funds by all utilizing the same questions, you know, community members from neighboring towns might all be interested in the same strategies. And so that will allow their select boards or boards of health to come together and see where there might be crossover. And I think we're all in favor of, um, you know, when there's not a lot of funds to sustain new projects, this might be a really good option. Um, and then because of Hampshire Hope, we have the capacity and we have the partnerships. So um, most recently, the Hampshire Hope Executive Coalition um, took a look at the survey, also approved it. And there we had some other partners who gave their input, folks from Cooley Dickinson, um, folks from Tapestry, um, criminal justice areas. And so I think there's been a really good set of eyes who's reviewed it. Our next step is to send out the survey. So we are like 99% done. Um, you know, I'm happy to talk about some of the details more tonight if there are questions. But the idea is that we'll be able to share this online as the, the primary mode for folks to fill it out. Um, we'll have QR codes, flyers. Again, this will be going out to all counties. And the first kind of questions are where do you live? And you can select it. And then also where do you work? So we're not just limiting the survey to folks who live in Hampshire County, but people who may be impacted because of their work, because of school, and then um, live outside. Um, the next phase that we're just kind of waiting on is the Hampshire Hope website. It's going to have a landing page for the survey, as well as where to get other information. So right now, it's you have to do some digging through the Attorney General's website. It's very complicated to see how much each town is even getting. And so we're hoping that we can redirect folks to kind of one shared page where they can learn more information. Once the survey data has been analyzed, you know, maybe we'll have some sort of um, one pager, a report that gives an overview and highlights that could live on the website. And so that is what the group is seeing. Um, I'll end with some forecasting, things that we're still determining is how to allow folks to fill it out who don't have internet access, smartphones, technology may be a barrier. And so some ideas that have come up are um, using the reverse 911 as a way to alert people that the survey is out, having folks call in to potentially the DHHS to have help fill, you know, reading the questions and having it filled out that way. Communities are interested in printing out paper copies and um, having piles in the senior center, the library, your town hall, and folks can fill it out on paper, distribute it back to a drop box or kind of collection box. Um, so some of this is still in the works. It you know will have to be a little bit more strategic, but we certainly want to think about um, equity, making sure that you know we're not just hearing from one type of specific population, but that we're really, you know, doing some outreach. I think that's it. I mean, it's a lot, again, at the crux of this is really to hear from folks who have been directly impacted. So a, a good chunk of this survey does ask questions around, um, are you a person who is actively using substances, someone who has used drugs, you've had family members, loved ones, 
who, you know, any of the above or are in recovery, you've lost folks. Um, we even have an option of you are a caretaker of, you know, children or a child because of the opioid epidemic, thinking about grandparents who may have been impacted in this way. And so it's pretty comprehensive. I'm very, very excited to start hearing from community members. So both Northampton and other communities can begin spending the money and allocating it. So I'll pause there. I'm sure there are questions. Taylor? Yeah. What's, well, what's the size of the award? Uh, the funding? Yeah. Um, well, that depends on just Northampton or if we're talking, you know, communities across Hampshire County. It really depends. The way it was calculated was looking at um population size and then the impact of overdose fatalities in that region. So it's not always that the biggest city is getting the most, but that that is kind of so Northampton, East Hampton are receiving, I would say the most in in Hampshire County, but Belchertown, where um Amherst communities that have been impacted by this or receiving a sizable amount. Meredith, do you have the I do have the Northampton yeah. specific it's numbers on that paper. It's a little bit over $1.1 million right now, and it goes through 2038, I believe. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and um, are you asking about access to care and treatment? Are you asking about barriers? Are you asking about types of treatment people are seeking, things like that? So the way the survey is broken up, if we're thinking about like a sandwich, we have... Um, you know, one end of it being questions about you and how you've been impacted, the meat of it, all the toppings are those categories. And the way we built it is off of um, the attorney general has seven pre-approved categories of spending. Um, just to rattle them off quickly, one is treatment options. Category two is supporting people in treatment and recovery. So the first kind of being increasing MOUD or detox beds. The second category being, how do we support people in reaching those types of treatments? Category three, connections to care. Category four, harm reduction. Category five, ad addressing the needs of criminal justice involved persons. Category six, supporting pregnant or parenting women and their families. Um, and category seven, preventing misuse of opioids. So. Uh, and then what we do is we list out strategies under each of those categories and ask folks to kind of pick what they might say their top priorities or strategies are. Um, and the reason why we wanted to approach it this way is that many of our communities, if you're receiving over $35,000, you have to fill out a report and it asks how much money are you spending in category one, two, three, and so we thought that if we kind of laid it out similar to how we'll be held accountable, it would keep things um, nice and clear moving forward. So, you know, and then under each of those categories, you have some some common themes that reoccur. So some are um, focused on grief supports for both, you know, frontline caregivers or frontline workers, and then also family members or folks who might have lost people to opioid overdoses. There are a few different responses that relate to um, youth mental health and supporting young people and preventing substance misuse, um, and then a lot around treatment and recovery, I would say. So, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Cynthia? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the survey is regional, right? And so... Um, but Northampton or each city and town has an allocation. So once we uh, receive the results of the survey, um, who is going to decide how the, how the funds will be um, allocated and to what groups? Sure. So each community um, already has the amount that they will be allocated. That was determined by the attorney general's office. So we have no power or say in how much money they're getting. And ultimately, we actually don't have the power or say to tell them what to do. You know, 
I think what our um, aim with the survey is to really do our, our due diligence and with good faith hear from community members and say, this is what folks are looking for and, you know, have it be a bit of a needs assessment. So um, yes, Northampton, we will hold it. We will have the data, but then we will disseminate, you know, to each town. Here's how many of your community members responded. Here were the top, you know, strategies or priorities. And then hopefully they're able to, to carry that out and are interested in their community members. I would add that on that report I just referenced from the attorney general's office, they do ask questions. What did you do to hear from community members? Did you target, you know, um, LGBTQIA populations? How did you think about equity? Um, and so again, this is, we are just trying to help our, our communities and neighbors be able to fill that survey out and yeah, make it feel so, true to the reason we're getting the money in the first place. So, so once we do get the results and let me just focus on Northampton for a second and we have the categories, who is going to decide how much of our allotment is going to which category? So, right. So I'm kind of the fiscal manager of that. I take the information. I'll bring that information to the powers that be, and that would be the mayor, the city councilors. And I think um, collaboratively, we'll figure out the best way to spend that money that serves the people and what we've heard from the feedback on the surveys. Great. Thank you. Yes. And just as like a, a counter, I would say, there is one community in Hampshire County that's created their own kind of working group in that community. And so it'll look different in every every community. So just well, and some another. communities have already spent their fiscal year 23 allocations. Um, so everything everybody's doing it a little differently, but we thought because we have the infrastructure, we have Qualtrics, a software program that can provide, you know, aggregate data per community. Um, we have Taylor that if we can convene this in any way, we have the, the infrastructure here to do so. Janet? Uh, so it sounds really comprehensive. So I was wondering how long it was, how many questions there are. Um, I was also wondering if it's in Spanish and, and or other languages and which ones. And I was wondering if you're targeting also, that's probably not a good word, but people incarcerated or people in after incarceration services. Okay, I'm gonna start backwards because that's the question I'll remember right now. So um, folks who, you know, the terminology that is used throughout the survey and also the past Hampshire Hope grant for um, justice impacted individuals that I, got to talk to you all about, um, will certainly be a population that we try and talk to. Um, yeah, I mean, very important for women that'll look a little bit different as they're not located in Hampshire County, they're down in Chigabee, but we do have partners. Um, you know, we can work with places like the Community Justice Center, um, partners in probation, but also I think important to talk to people before they are back in the community. So supports that, you know, they may be looking for exist. And so we do have those partnerships. Um, that's certainly important. Um, in terms of translation, no, we don't have that ready yet. And that is a huge priority of the group. Um, so it's something we are still working on. Spanish most definitely, but I do think other languages are going to be more relevant in certain communities. And so we want to, you know, pay attention to that. I'm happy to take suggestions. Um, if you have any. And what was the first question? Just how long is it? How many questions? It is, right now, it the um, estimated time is 10 minutes. So oh. it's it's um, as lengthy as you want to make it. I think some people could spend a lot of time really looking into it, but 10 minutes, and we're really not trying to have it be much longer, especially if we're trying to be out in the community at vaccination clinics and have a tablet and have people fill it out or you know, sitting down in the library or senior center. So that's our aim there. Okay, so, thank you. Taylor, just um, so I don't forget, Angelise Chahana is doing a lot of our communication translation and yes. then Iman Saran has also um, offered her services to do translation. Thanks, Ernest. 
Dallas? Hey, I'm just wondering if you're collecting demographics and if so, um, or if there's any standard way you're using SOGI data collection in, or if you're trying to collect sexual orientation, gender identity in that. And if there's like, a, if it's, if there's, if it's right in or if it's, you know, two step or if that might be too tactical of a question too. No, you, um, I, again, so I am not the survey expert of this, but yeah, the last, you know, is giving the one sandwich bun, the meat, the third piece is some demographic data and we're asking or phrasing it as more about you. Um, we are asking for age ranges. Um, I've gotten some questions recently about, you know, can young people fill it out? They certainly can. I think it would be great to have, you know, their voices into this. So we ask age range. We ask um, a lot of the questions as how do you identify? So for um, gender, we phrase it that way. We have check all that apply. We ask um, which the following best represents how you identify for sexual orientation um, and allow for different clickings. Um, we also, for almost all questions, um, if we're talking about strategies and you know tools, we ask for other and we give options. For um, the demographics, we have I identify as blank and are allowing folks to fill in an option if we do not have it listed. We're also asking some racial and ethnic information, um, including again, I identify as blank if we don't have something listed. Um, and all of these questions are optional and we state that at the top. Um, Ideally, people fill it out so we can, you know, have an idea of who is answering this, but we are not having any mandatory questions. Dallas, did that answer what you were curious about? I, I believe so, yes. So you're asking okay. sexual orientation, gender identity questions, and you're asking uh, the ability to select multiple and yes. to fill in the blank area too. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any, any other questions or comments? So uh, Taylor, when do you think this survey will go out? It sounds like you're on the cusp of, of getting it out there. Yes, I'm like so anxious to say this on something that's being recorded, but um, we are hoping that um, within the next about week and a half, um, next week, we're really gonna be making sure that the supporting resources are on that website. Um, Something we also do at the top of the survey is just give folks a heads up that we are discussing heavier topics. And so we link out to some um, partners for both grief supports and different hotlines. Um, so again, we wanna be able to direct people back to the Hampshire Hope website for more information. So we have Melissa, our technology um, manager, staff person within DHHS, who's working on that right now. Um, but things are about set and ready to go. So I should add, we also, um, you know, some sort of press release or I'm looking to see if we can maybe, you know, share this within the media to let folks know that um, it's time. There's been lots of media stories that, you know, are a little bit more negative. People aren't spending the money or they're spending it in a wrong way. And so we want to let communities member, community members know what's happening in Hampshire County. It's great. Very exciting. Um, any other questions for Taylor on this topic of the opioid settlement money and survey? Great. Thank you. Now we're going to ask you to hang in there <laughs> and uh, talk about uh, opioid prevention centers. And I would like the board members to listen with the idea of whether we as a board want to take a stand, make a statement, or or Yes, and I, I was going to say, I am totally fine to hang in here. I hope you all don't get tired of hearing the same voice. Um, can folks see the full screen of the PowerPoint? Okay, great. Um, I may not be able to see people's hands or if there's questions. I am totally fine if folks want to interrupt me or if you prefer to wait to the end. Um, it does not bother me. So here to talk about overdose prevention centers. Um, I just wanted to say, I think people may have heard these by different names. Sometimes they're used, you know, interchangeably. So 
Supervised Injection Facilities, or SIFs, S-I-F, was used quite a few years back. Not everyone injects drugs, so supervised consumption sites came up. Overdose prevention sites, overdose prevention centers is what is used in the current legislation. So that's what I'm going to use throughout this presentation. And we will call them OPCs for short. I'll talk a little bit about what they are, the outcomes and the evidence that exists um, for these outcomes of OPCs. And then similar to what M did before, I'll do kind of a you know, big picture, zoom into Massachusetts, and then talk about our local context. It's not too long of a PowerPoint. Um, okay, so what happens inside an OPC? Uh, you could think about it as almost a hub for harm reduction services. Um, you know, again, kind of at the crux of harm reduction, meeting people where they're at. OPCs provide an array of services. The person comes in with their pre-obtained drugs. Um, so, you know, there's no kind of liability there. They show up with it, and depending on the site, people may consume the substance in different ways. Um, trained staff are there and able to help if there is an accidental overdose. Uh, and just that the, the type of staff varies. Most times you have people with um, medical provider backgrounds, but then you'll also have folks from the social work sphere, public health, maybe housing, or you know, kind of connectors to outside resources so that uh, there's this no wrong door approach as people are there and create trusting relationships with the staff, they feel more comfortable and safer asking about additional supports that they may be looking for. OPCs are not new. Um, they're new to the United States, but um, they have been happening for many, many years across many different countries, 11 countries. Um, and it really, it is so notable to say no person has died of an overdose at an overdose prevention center. It is because people are there. And if you go to other presentations about this topic, you know, I, I think um, the biggest takeaway is that overdoses are preventable. And this is a tool that's available to make sure that we're able to prevent them from happening. Um, so some benefits of uh, overdose prevention centers the first and foremost being reducing the risk of accidental overdose. Um, this says here, because people are not rushing, it's because you're in a space where you can feel comfortable. You're not looking over your shoulder. You can take more time and care and consciousness while you're um, consuming the substance. But again, you're also not using alone. People are there. Narcan is not always used. Sometimes it's just oxygen and monitoring. Um, because it hasn't hit the point of Narcan needing to be given. Um, other, you know, kind of more public benefits, it reduces public drug use and discarded drug equipment. So if people have a place to dispose of their syringes and grab them at the same time, it's going to stay with inside that unit. It reduces spread of infectious diseases, again, tied to um, having a clean and sanitized space, having clean equipment, um, reduces strain on EMS. Uh, this is a really big one. If people are not experiencing overdoses or coming across someone who has had an overdose in a public space, 911 does not need to be called because the trained staff and medical providers are right there. Um, and then really other incredible benefits. I, you know, referenced this just in the slide previously, but connecting folks to uh, different treatment options, um, primary care physicians, holistic health services, um, additional social services, housing, employment, um, you know, where you can get food, work on your resume. You have, you know, all of these other kind of social determinant of health factors that can be met within the space. And the biggest one also, you know, in addition to reducing overdoses, but just human connection having the trust of the staff that work there, feeling like you are a human and cared for, um, and that you know people are not turning a blind eye to you on the street, that you have a welcoming space. So two pictures here. This top one that looks like a really chill zone, this is from On Point's Holistic Health Room. On Point is the only operating overdose prevention center in the US right now. 
They have two locations in different boroughs of New York City. Um, so this is one space that people probably don't picture when they hear overdose prevention centers. The second picture is what is most commonly, I think, thought of. So you can see that this is where people may grab their, their works or supplies, the syringes, their cottons, baggies. Um, and then they have small kind of public or small private stations, cubbies, um, where each individual can sit. And typically there's a mirror so that staff are able to kind of monitor what's going on without hovering over the individual. Okay, so now zooming down, um, there is pending legislation in Massachusetts. And I have my little silly call out here to the left, but policy is really, really crucial because of the legality and licensing fears. So right now we're talking about either public, um, public offices or private businesses renting the space, leasing the space, knowing that drugs that are not legal may be consumed. We have doctors, nurses, NPs, PAs who are worried about their licensing statutes. And so um, what policy does is take away that liability. Um, the, the bills passed, you know, there's one in the House, one in the Senate. Right now they are sitting in committee. And I just listed here most of our local representatives and senators have signed on in support. I actually think all have, as well as a good group outside of Hampshire County. So this is something that has been talked about amongst our local policy leaders. Um, the legislation itself, it calls for a 10-year pilot program. It's almost identical to how syringe service programs were first rolled out from the state. Same idea, 10-year pilot program, boards of health um, would have a say, um, DPH collects data, it's studied, and so it's really being modeled, I would say, off of syringe service programs, needle exchanges. Uh, in just the fall, there was a survey that um, was taken across Massachusetts, they asked voters of, you know, across the political spectrum, Democrat, Republic, not registered, um, what you think about overdose prevention centers. And right off the bat, 70%, um, so seven in 10, said they were in support of the bill. I don't have it pictured here, but at the end of the survey, when people learned more about what OPCs provide, that number goes up to eight in 10. And so I think it's very powerful to say that general support is moving in a more positive direction towards this. Um, and then also to 73% of voters think we should be doing more to address the issue. Um, and OPCs is obviously a big next step in action that communities can take. Some more statewide updates. Um, these next two slides are just from about a month ago. So in December, before the holidays, and then all our political leaders went to take their breaks, two big reports were released. One came from the John Snow Institute. Um, it was prepared for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and it's titled Expanding Spaces for People Who Use Drugs in Massachusetts. I should add, after I'll share these slides, um, all of the links at the bottom will take you to the tools that I'm referencing in the slides so people can read these reports. But um, this report is very comprehensive. They um, interviewed different harm reduction agency staff people across the state. So uh, Tapestry was involved in this project for Western Mass and also interviewed 356 participants. So the people who utilize those harm reduction agencies. Um, I pulled two quotes, uh, the bottom being, we save each other every day. OPCs are happening um, behind closed doors. People who use drugs are saving their friends and peers and loved ones every day. Um, this is something that we can be doing in a more sanctioned way. And, um, you know, you can see the other quote. It, um, they found that 76% of participants would go to an overdose prevention center if one was available. Um, and they also talk about how they feel safe with the staff of these agencies already, that it, you know, if they can kind of stay within trusted systems, that would help. 
this report, they do layouts. They show what spaces could look like. They go into um, funding dollars. So I obviously could not cover all of that, but it's a really great tool to look at. And this is what ultimately then gave the Massachusetts Department of Public Health their, um, their reasoning. And they came out in support of overdose prevention centers um, in December, 2023. Their report, again, linked at the bottom of this slide, they cover some data from overdose prevention centers. They talk about economic implications. I personally don't like talking about the money. I like talking about saving lives, but it also saves money going back to um, taking strain off of the emergency medical system, taking strain out of the hospitals because people are not getting as sick. They're not getting soft tissue infections. This does have a dollar amount tied to it as well. In 2019, there was a statewide harm reduction commission that came out in favor of this. They talk a bit about that. Um, and then they spend a bit of time talking about the legal consideration. And so again, just this call out that the importance of passing policy is really big so that we can do this in the right way without having policy. You're, you're opening up a lot of doors for fear. Um, and, you know, again, even just the questions of the, the criminality behind it come up. So the bottom paragraph here is what DPH has to say. They see it as an evidence-based life-saving tool. It is comprehensive public health approach. The Commonwealth is typically leading the charge on these issues. And so this is one way that Massachusetts can really join the few states who have acted on it. Um, and just in that bottom sentence as well, uh, they really, they they want to see policy passed. Um, otherwise, this document that they released actually talks about statutes that the state itself could take for medical licensing and provider licensing to, you know, kind of skirt around policy if it doesn't happen. Last slide, local context. Um, back in 2022, the Northampton City Council passed a resolution in support of overdose prevention sites. And they, at the time, cited the legislation that was being considered back then. Um, legislation has been around for, I would say, oh, goodness, the last eight years, maybe. And so it's, you know, it's not new to have these, these ordinances have come up. Um, but it's, it's very nice to know that they were in support. And then even more locally, very excited to say that one of our DART coordinators, Kathy, is visiting on point um, next month in February due to a NACHO grant that um, we have held with some Hamden County partners. So she'll be representing DART and representing the Department of Health and Human Services when she attends. And that Meredith and I are also very interested in working on coordinating a bigger team. So not just one individual from the city, but thinking about um, you know partners who would be very key if this were to come to Northampton and how a group or a team could go to visit either on point, or I would say that um, in the next year, Rhode Island will be opening up their own site. And so to be able to visit one um, would be a great opportunity for us all. That is it for the slideshow. So I'm gonna stop share. If people have direct questions about slides, I'm more than happy to you know, pull them back up, but I'll pause for now. Questions, comments? Taylor, that was excellent. A great overview of both. I thank you so much. And I'll make sure that I get out your slides to the Board of Health members um, in the next couple of days or so. Great. Thank you. Cynthia? Yeah, thanks, uh, Joanne. Taylor, thank you so much. And just so that I have the uh, progression right, first, we need a state for Commonwealth policy. Is that, I mean, we have some stuff kicking around, right? Um, so we need to get that approved. And then once that happens, we can move to um, cities and towns. Yes. Or, uh, so it should happen in that order. Uh, in the way that people are feeling most protects um, folks who would be working the site 
and also protects those that are walking in with pre-obtained substances and are using the site and aren't going to be feared of having, you know, legal or criminal ramifications. That is the best way to go about it. Um, so New York, I will say they are operating their on point sites with zero state legislation. Um, what that means as well, though, is that it is being um, either grant funded or privately funded and that there have been scares about, you know, the attorney general coming in and saying you cannot do this. Um, they've had a great partnership with the New York City Police Department. And so, you know, on a local level, there's common agreements that are in place. Um, but it you you do want some sort of policy. So the alternative would be the governor could potentially put something in place without, you know, um, our our other senators and representatives voting on a policy. Um, so the governor actually, I believe in Rhode Island, went about it that way. Taylor, two questions just to add on to that. Isn't yep. there a community in Massachusetts that is hosting? Oh, I think I lost Zoom. Can oh. you hear me? I can, I can hear you still. My connection is weak. It keeps on telling me. Um, there's a community in Massachusetts that is um hosting an OPC that's obviously before the legislation is that not correct they are um so Somerville has been pretty adamant that they are moving forward with this regardless of policy it I wouldn't say it's up and running yet maybe to, to the most public extent I'm not going to say if there's like harm reductionists doing stuff to save lives but Somerville's mayor and their um public health folks are basically have said we're prepared to do this regardless. And so um, they have their own batch of really great resources, focus groups that happened, their own feasibility study. So they they are most determined, I would say. My second question, you might have answered this. Um, if the legislation does pass, is it two pilot sites or was there a finite amount on There's the pilot sites? No, mm -hmm. no number of pilot sites. Okay. Um, what came up a lot in the most recent testimony is that if communities are interested, they want to support it, but that they're not even saying it needs to be a minimum number. Um, but the the number that was mentioned, it's a pilot site for 10 years. So that's what the that's what they're saying. Um, a long enough time to kind of study and see what happens. But no number as to how many communities. That's all local decision making. Jan, uh, I thought I read in one of the reports that we got sent that there were two agencies that were interested, and I'm wondering if any of them are in Western Mass at this point. And I, I also just um, wondering how the states that are doing it now are dealing with it on a federal level. Yeah. Um, I, Janet, your first question, I am not sure what report you're referencing. So I'm- There's, uh, we got two, a, Feasi a F overdose prevention center feasibility report and then, mm -hmm. a, and then JSI's report, which was very long. I mean, not very long, just a lot of pages, but it wasn't- yes. You know, there was a um, lot of quotes on there and stuff too, but. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I will say there are definitely partners in Western Mass who are in favor. Tapestry is on a statewide group. Um, Cooley Dickinson in their, you know, partnership now with, is it Mass Brigham, Mass General? Mass General. Mass General are vocal supporters and advocates for the policy. So, uh, you know, that's probably not what you're referencing in the report, but I can mm -hmm. just fill that piece in okay. um your second question about federal law oh yeah so this is another um big gray area but what has come up as a comparison is that we legalized cannabis and federally that is not you know the the statute and so um the other piece the administration that we have right now with president biden is the first president to kind of put out a harm reduction report um, and really pursue harm reduction as a strategy. So folks feel like right now the federal support would, you know, would be there silently 
or, you know, there, there wouldn't be any pushback, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think anyone can say that that would be the case with, with the change. Um, Philadelphia at one time seems like they were going to be the first and um, that got tangled up in a, a bit of a federal um, battle. So that's still ongoing. That's right. Yeah. So um, these two bills that one in the house and one in the Senate, you said they've been sort of out there for about 10 years already. Did they, I'm trying to think back and there, there's people on this call who have been doing harm reduction work mm -hmm. longer than I have. But I mean, I can remember back in at least 2018 bills being talked about. There was a group, SIFMA Now, that was really kind of, I would say, the first trying to organize statewide. Um, now, Massachusetts for Overdose Prevention Centers is also a, another group. But um, yeah, I mean, this it, it didn't always move forward. I would say for some of the years, it kind of fell stagnant. Um, the last session, it did get voted out of committee. Right now, it is in committee. Um, and February 10th, I believe, is that that deadline for legislation to either move out and move on or kind of fall to the wayside. So, And um, the state has said that they're in favor of it, but would they support it monetarily? I mean, are they offering grant money? That is, um, I don't know. I don't know. And yes, I guess with the state, we're talking um, the Department of Public Health um, representing the state on that, but I'm, there is not, to my knowledge, any money tied to it as of right now. Um, um, I, yeah. I just wanted to comment that um, while this makes a great deal of sense from public health perspective, and we all see this and get it, there's tremendous political forces in opposition to this. Um, this is not an easy lift. And I think that there are magnitudes of difference between um, cannabis and um, injectable drugs that are potentially fatal immediately, almost. Um, and there's also the, the issues of um, where are these going to go? The NIMBY issues, um, the problems that they've run into at Mass and Cast, I think, um, just show that this is a really difficult concept to get support for. Um, and I was going to ask earlier, you know, what is, what have you heard from the local law enforcement and the, and the, the state police in Western Massachusetts about their perspectives of all of, about all of this? There are a lot of players in this that do not want this to happen. So I'm not saying that the police don't. I'm just saying that there are just a lot of people who don't want this to happen. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. Um, I can't speak to the state police. Um, I will say that even, you know, before my role with Hampshire Hope, that um, the coalition itself, which has partners from uh, law enforcement, have been talking about overdose prevention centers or safe injection facilities, SIFs, as they used to be referred to for quite a bit of time. So I don't want to like spout out anything wrong, but I will say that maybe there's a little bit more openness than in other regions, but maybe it's not full, you know, 100% support, but I think people are willing to have the conversation and that's the biggest, you know, door to have open. Um, I would also say our DA is a massive vocal supporter, has visited sites in Canada and so um, it's a really interesting partner to have in this because I think DA Sullivan builds an interest, you know, a, a powerful bridge between public health support and um, buy-in and partnership with law enforcement. Um, but yeah, the other thing I just would add, especially hearing the reference to Mass and Cass, and I think people think about really urban areas, is um, some of the sites that have existed in Canada are, are tailored to smaller communities or rural communities. And so it's not always a big um, clinic. Sometimes it's just a separate floor in another building that's being utilized by folks who are going there for other services already. Um, the Somerville report, if people are interested in, they talk a lot about um, mo like not mobile units, but stationary kind of trailers in different public spaces or 
what would it look like to have something that's mobile? And so um, I think the state is really hoping that the local level will be able to make it work for their community that, you know, what works out in Eastern Mass would not necessarily work out here in, in Western Mass or Hampshire County. And if, if I can just add to um, your question, Suzanne, um, Chief Casper, prior to her leaving, was very vocal in support yeah. of the concept of OPCs. Of course, there was a lot of detail that needed to be worked out in thinking if it was here in Northampton, what it looked like. But um, conceptually speaking, she was very supportive. She's all about harm reduction as well. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Thank Erin. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, Meredith also sent out a lot of information uh, to us ahead of this meeting. That was um, Thank you. Yeah, it was of great. Course. Um, I'm um, wondering if anyone, there's nothing, so no urgency, but I'm wondering if anyone feels like we as a board should take a stand. And even a stand doesn't have to say it's for Northampton, just supporting, again, the concept of OPCs in Massachusetts, I think speaks volume. Um, just to add that in your thought process. The, the city council resolution that Taylor, you put up, I think the title of it was to support services. It, it, it didn't come out specifically and say OPC, or did it? Uh, um, it is titled, so it's a little bit sneaky, but, yeah. but it's a great catch. It is titled um, a resolution in support of overdose prevention services. And so um, I, you know, if, if there wasn't a copy sent, Meredith, I'm sure can pass that along. Um, the title itself does not say overdose prevention centers. It does call out overdose prevention centers and their whereas statements. It does call out the bill at the time that was being considered, but it also does kind of address um, many other tools of harm reduction and um, how it's crucial. You know, overdose rates are still incredibly high, overdose fatalities are still incredibly high, and in that it's seen as a valid tool. So, yeah, there there is a little bit of that. So it's, it seems like, you know, there's a spectrum of, of us in terms of we could go the sneaky route <laughs> or we could move along that continuum and just uh, give a more forceful recommendation um, or, or, or support of, of these initiatives to kind of help the state move along. So, um, you know, I'm, I personally am willing to entertain any discussion about that or if we wanted to think about it. Um, if, if we think it's helpful. Taylor, is there hearing before now and um, when this legislation is either passed or dies? There is going to be a, a push at the end of this month, um, an event at the State House on the 26th, I believe. I can get the exact date. Um, that's focusing on the voices of family members and parents. So on the long day that testimony was given, um, our, our political leaders kind of spoke first. It was a long day. I was very lucky to be there to listen. But around four o'clock in the afternoon is when parents and families gave their own personal testimony, which was incredibly, incredibly moving. And so um, they're hoping that, you know, to really make that the focus of another event at the end of the month and use that as a final push. So there's not a formal hearing again, but there is going to be, um, you know, a public event that hopefully gets some media attention. Um, I will say we're, again, very lucky to have our elected officials that we have who are very attuned to these public health bills and um, have been great partners. And I also just wanted to add, too, if this is something the group is thinking about, I'm happy to continue to provide resources or be of help in you know, drafting things up or um, continuing to answer questions if, you know, this this moves on past tonight, so. I appreciate that. That's, that would be very helpful. Any other thoughts?
Um, so should we do sort of a straw poll? Do we, do we want to take a statement uh, or, or take a stand? Um, why don't we um, take a picture of the Board of Health members if- What's that? Why don't we take the temperature of the Board of Health members to see if they'd like to have a statement of support in any way? Just by thumbs up if you want us mm -hmm. to pursue drafting a statement of support or anybody? <laughs> um, I, I just what keeps going around in my in my head is that um, this bill has stalled in the state house for 10 years. Isn't that not what was told earlier? And I think that to me is a um, clear statement of the political will or lack of a political will, except for some courageous legislators. And I, I do think it's whether, whether things are important from a public health standpoint or not, it's an important piece of information to understand the context in which we're trying to move on something or support something. And, and that's the thought I keep having as I contemplate this. Dallas? I was just trying to clarify, what exactly are we saying that we are supporting here? Well, that's a good question. It's up to us to decide. Taylor? I didn't, am I allowed to respond? I don't know. <laughs> if sure. okay. Um, yeah, so, oh, Suzanne, it is, it's a really hard point, I guess, I would just, um, it did move out of committee last time. And yeah. so that's, you know, now we're talking, that's like, three to four years ago with the way the, the cycles work. Um, but just a few things that I think have changed um, the landscape, both across the state and nationally is, this is the first time that um, we have a governor who is not explicitly against it. So um, Governor Baker was not in favor. I think that was a, a big barrier that existed. Um, governor Healy now has said that she's in favor of harm reduction and that this is, you know, falls under harm reduction. It's the first time the Department of Public Health has come out in favor and released these feasibility studies and released reports. Um, and they also, you know, this was not included, but they did release a, a comprehensive report on overdose data. They hadn't really done this since, um, goodness, again, probably 2018, there was a report called Chapter 55, but um, they released another report and they talk about the rates of overdose, what is in the drug supply. And so um, every year it continues to, to feel more urgent, um, but that there has been some political shifts that didn't exist um, previously. Thank you for that. So um, Taylor, can you give us some advice of what you think would be most um, efficacious for us to do? Or you can think about that. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, um, any mention of coming out in support of increased harm reduction measures is powerful. I think something else that, you know, we are, we did ask about overdose prevention centers on the opioid settlement funds. So there is a chance that community members come back and have this listed as a priority area. And so it might be nice to um, be a bit ahead of the ball and, you know, have kind of a, a position that's, that's made publicly before that happens so that, you know, we, we as a city kind of know whether we're in favor or not, or where the Board of Health lands. So that's something to consider. Um, drug testing continues to become more available. And so I think you could include other tools that you know you would like to see prioritized along with the exploration of overdose prevention centers. But I, I am fully in support of any support, so. We, we could also, Joanne, to, you know, and Taylor, thank you for those ideas. And to respond to Dallas's question, to say that we support the um, legislation. Um, and it sounds like we have Cooley Dickinson and DPH supporting the legislation. Um, 
And um, I mean, I, I, do people feel comfortable with, you know, we're this collective group of people that are supporting one another to move in this direction? I'd feel very comfortable with that. I would too. Yeah, I, I like the idea of putting it in terms of um, that we support exploring the uh, overdose prevention centers because I I feel like I'm just getting a lot of data now and that it's going to continue to come in as well as the survey results and stuff like that. So, um, you know, as along with other harm reduction measures. I don't think we need to say that we are supporting having one in Northampton necessarily, but supporting the concept um, and the data mm -hmm. and the legislation. Cynthia, I like your suggestion because I think it's a lot easier for me and a lot easier for people to understand that there is already legislation that has been drafted and has been introduced and as you said, even got out of committee or Taylor, you said got out of committee. That's a very tangible, specific um, area where there's already been considerable work, the ground has been laid, legis certain legislators have bought into it, legislation has been drafted, it's been debated. Supporting that specific item is a lot easier for me to do. And I think a lot more useful than <clears throat> us coming out with some broad support of um, harm reduction strategies in general, this being one of them, oh, by the way, because I think the emphasis will get lost in, in some yeah, way. Yeah, I, I worry about that too, yeah. So, so just to clarify then, so waiting until we see what happens with the, with it coming out of committee and then supporting that legislation or supporting the legislation as it, wherever it is right now, is that? If we have a, if we have a, a number on a bill, yeah. and it's gone through a couple of things, I would just reference those and say, we support yeah. these because the, the language will get, get tweaked as it goes along mm -hmm. anyway. We hope it goes along, but I, I I think just supporting those two bills on both sides um, of the house. Uh, that's a that's also something that legislators can keep track of. You know, our, these are constituents and these are people with a, a particular role in this community who support this bill that we are working on. Yeah, I like that. <clears throat> I like that. Um, does anyone want to volunteer to uh, start a draft? So Taylor mentioned that she'd be happy. I was like, I don't know if I'm, but yes, I'm more than happy to. If you want to um, have one of the board members help co-write it, and then that'd be great. Volunteer. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you all for giving me the space to talk about this. Thank you, you've been a wealth of information. <clears throat> I think that the, um, the um, what the city council did might be a good place to start because I th think that was basically in support of the legislation as well. Yeah. Does anybody have any other sort of final questions or comments? Um, we, I was looking forward to, uh... Michelle's presentation, and I'm I'm really sorry to hear she's ill. I, I I have a process question that I was going to bring up next time we talked about um, the uh, division of community care. It's called ER, and um, we see a number of people who appear to be houseless that are um, asking for resources in the streets. Is is it appropriate? if it in the right context. Um, I had one or two opportunities to have a conversation with, with these folks. And I directed them to the Divin Division of Community Care. Neither one knew anything about this. 
Um, and so I'm wondering about how outreach is, is occurring, um, what it, whether it is appropriate to suggest that folks um, reach reach out to the Division of Community Care or stop by during their hours. Is it possible for us to have cards, business cards that have this information and what's available and to hand to folks? Just say, just thinking about it, you know, just, I know it's getting real cold and, and this can be a really hard time. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you for bringing this up. Yeah, we're sad about Michelle not being here today because we'd love to have given you this real robust, um, you know, year one into really kind of um, planning and then operating for the last four months. We wanted to give you this, what was happening, what we were seeing, outcomes, the types of calls we were getting, the responses we were doing, so on and so forth. But before I get into that, I just want to say thank you so much, Taylor. Um, for that presentation. That's lovely. I will um, I will start the Google Doc and just join you and Cynthia on that. So then you can both work on it together because I'm not sure you have each other's email. Um, no, that's, that's great. Thanks, Meredith. I'll move forward with that. So I just want to say thank you. If you want to hang on, feel free to join the rest of the Board of Health meeting. If not, have a great night. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Taylor. Yeah, so I mean, what a timely question, Suzanne, especially with this really cold weather that we're having this week and then what we're supposed to be seeing this weekend. And I even hate to inform you this, but the emergency hotel room policy has changed as well. So, I mean, we are in a housing crisis, we are in a shelter crisis, and then we're, you know, we're now hit with what used to be the threshold was a 20 degree temperature for less than four consecutive, oh, excuse me, for four consecutive hours or more, get emergency sheltering. All of these shelters would, op would open up and people could go somewhere, even if all of our normal shelters were full. That parameter has changed to 10 degrees or less for four hours. Why? I don't make those decisions because there's just no capacity, no support, no resources. Yeah. So we no longer can call for emergency sheltering when it's 11 mm -hmm. degrees out. It has to be 10 or less for four hours or more. Yeah. So it is hugely disheartening. So to answer your question, refer the folks to the DCC. We are not the resilience hub. There is a resilience hub that is run out of mana, mana but their, their time and resources are extremely limited. And when I first talked about the DCC and taking this under the DHHS umbrella, one of my main um, um, missions was to make sure that we are changing outcomes. Um, we were making, we were trying to help people before they hit the crisis level to make sure that we didn't have to get crisis involved or that they had to go to the emergency room. Well, housing is all consuming. So because we don't have a resilience hub that has the resources, you know, to be open even, you know, five days a week, never mind seven days a week, and five days a week, not even eight hours a day, we act kind of as a quasi resilience hub when they're not open or the survival center is not open where people can get food like we are providing those services so housing coordination is one of the primary services that we're actually providing in the dcc mm -hmm. as we're doing so much of that work um craig's door has allocated us x amount of dollars to be able to place people up in the uh the um hadley hotel i think it's called the quality and the nights Inn. excuse me the nights Inn which now has um, emergency housing in there, sheltering in there. Uh, it's, I, 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 it breaks my heart to see where the sheltering, sheltering and housing um, deficits and gaps are right now and how we can fill it. We need absolutely a full-time housing coordinator, not for the city, but for the region because it, it, it changes on the dime. So even if we were in the morning to call up every place that is a shelter or um, an emergency shelter, regular shelter, or provide supportive housing, you can't, I mean, every 10 minutes it changes, the capacity changes. So I'm thinking if there was like a Western Mass or even, you know, Central Mass 
Berkshire Mass and West, you know, Western Mass Housing Coordinator to help with placing people, it would be it would be amazing. But yes, refer to the DCC. We are doing the best that we can. We're putting together a whole marketing campaign, but because we're phasing in the types of services that respond that we are responding to, we want to go low and slow. We want to take we want to make sure that what we're doing, we're doing it right and that we're changing outcomes before we you know, mass market who we are. Um, we do have a very soft, a uh, very, very soft timeline on where we're going. Um, and I, I'm happy to to give you that information to the best of my ability. Again, I have a director and Michelle Fari, who is our deputy commissioner, holds most of this information. But I can tell you, um, let me get to it. I have some notes here. Hold on one second. While you're looking for it, I'm that new parameter for people getting into a shelter. Is this not going to lead even this week to people freezing to death? No. Mm -mm. It no, it's set. So they won't they won't open up the emergency shelter until the thresholds are met. Right. So what I'm saying is people may freeze to death this week. I'm, I mean, yes, <laughs> it happened. Yeah. I mean, we do, we and our partners in the community do the best that we can to provide, you know, outdoor weather gear, sleeping bags, tents. Um, I know some of the churches take people in. The shelters will maximize, you know, go above their maximum capacity. Nobody wants anyone to freeze to death, Janet, but the right. reality. I'm wondering what the temperature is at, at night. I don't even know. I mean, I know it's 20s during the day, so. Yeah. Yeah, so it's cold. Um, so right now, the next six months, this is kind of like a soft timeline of what we're doing. Right now, we're in, in the process of interviewing community responders. We are looking to hire four dark, uh, four dark community responders and three to five regular community responders. Um, and then we're hoping to have them hired by the 22nd, which is next week. Um, start the training. We'll have um, community responders will train for six weeks, including two weeks of field training. DART responders will have three additional weeks of classroom and field training. And then the training will end on April 5th. Um, beginning March 18th, we're looking to expand our hours in Northampton from Monday, uh, Monday, from fr Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 4 to 8.30 to 7. And then I have a four hour weekend block on the weekend. I'm not sure if it's going to be Saturday or Sunday. Um, we're currently starting to have conversations with Kelly Schutze and Lisa from Dispatch on what it looks like to integrate Dispatch. Um, so we'll be spending, I want to say March and April, writing protocols around dispatch. And then in April, we're going to identify someone who's going to be a DCC dispatcher. The dispatcher will sit in DCC, not in dispatch itself. May will finalize the protocols. And then uh, May, June, we'll train for the DCC dispatcher. And then hopefully July 1, um, we'll have dispatch integration into the DCC. So that's where we're going. Um, you know, again, we're, when the DCC is open, the community center, it acts more as a resilience hub than it does as space to deescalate and avert crisis. Um, when we're out going to the, doing the community response, it is more at that time and moment to de-escalate and avert crisis. And sometimes we bring those people back to the DCC and use that space for it. Um, but I'm telling you, when I think about the numbers that we are seeing, I think last time at our last meeting, I mentioned what we had to date. We opened the doors on September 5th of this year to the community space, and we've logged in 1,153 contacts so that could be not 
just a unique individual, but it could be a repeat contact with someone. But we've also logged in 350 unique individuals. So that means 350 different people coming to the DCC to help with their needs or help within a crisis moment. So the modalities come through a variety of, uh, of different means. It's either a phone call to 911. I think we've taken 39 dispatch calls from 911. Um, they can call into the DCC, voicemail, email, walk-in, or street connections. So it's busy. And may I add, we have been uh, short-staffed in the DCC probably since mid-November. We have had multiple rounds of illness go through my staff. Um, we've had um, long-term sickness and injury with a couple of our staff that have been out for four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, my director of the DCC um, lost her husband unexpectedly. Um, so she was out. There is just staffing has been a real issue and we're still seeing 1,153 contacts. Nope. So it's, it's been busy. It's been quite a learning curve, lots to do still. And Michelle's going to come and talk about, um, she's going to get more granular with what we've been doing, but also talk about where it is we see the board could help and support this work. Meredith, can you also just, not, not now, but if Michelle uh, Michelle can fold into a report that, um, you know, when we think of the Resilience Hub, we think of, I know MANA, but we also think of that building, the church. Mm -hmm. And where, where are we at with yeah. what I thought that Resilience Hub was supposed to be doing the work that we're doing? Um, so that just if you could just give us a picture of that at some point in time, that would be great because people ask about it. Where is the resilience? Absolutely. So, right. We're just a stopgap until that's open, right? Because then the DCC and the Resilience Hub will be cohabitating and we'll be working together. Um, so the good news is the contract is finally signed with the architecture. I think that happened about three or four weeks ago. We had our first meeting. They have met with MANA. I think they've met with Cap V and they've met with the city side to talk about space and, and use of the space. Um, I We're meeting again next week to go and talk about the next steps. And I think that's all about community engagement, sharing space, who's going to be at the Resilience Hub. And yeah, so it's happening, but it took a long time to get there. I think best case scenario, Cynthia, we're probably a year and a half out. There are some big infrastructure problems that have to be resolved um, before we, you know, occupy that space, but there's there's a there's a large team on it. It's beautiful. If the Board of Health can find a time that you're all available, I'd love to take you on a tour there. I mean, wait until it's at least above 40 because it is cold. It is cold as heck in there, but um, I would love to bring you there just so you can imagine where we're going. Yeah, it, it gives some hope anyway to what we're facing right now. Yeah. Thank you for uh, filling us in, in Michelle's absence. Um, any other questions about the DCC for the moment? Okay. Um, so at our last meeting, which was quite a while ago, we had talked a little bit about the new synthetic drugs like Delta-8, Delta-10, and Crate. Great, Tom. Is that how we pronounce it? Um, and um, I don't know if you saw that video um, of a presentation from Cheryl Sabara. Um, and so what we had decided at the last meeting was that um, I guess there was some debate about whether these things are legal or not legal. Um, um, and 
rather than jumping to legislation, we thought at least as a first step or a more immediate step, uh, we would um, ask Meredith to write a letter to um, the um, stores and ask them to voluntarily take these products off their shelves. Um, so Meredith, where are we from, from then? I guess Belchertown passed their regulation on January 9th. Yeah. Everybody have a chance to look at that. Yep, and South Hadley has had um, a Board of Health meeting, and I believe they proposed a draft regulation as well. I'm not positive on that, but they're moving forward to pass a regulation as well. And just um, so I, I, I'd like to mention this, the synthetic THC, which is Delta 8, Delta 10, are legal. So there's no question about the legality. They are what? They are illegal. Illegal. Illegal, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Great, I think is still kind of a gray area on the legality of that. So anyways, um, I thought it was important at, after we had that conversation, I thought it was important that we actually had the voice of the youth. We did this before when we asked our merchants to take bath salts and other designer drugs off their shelves. So I reached out to Kara, who is our, um, prevent, our youth prevention coordinator to help craft this letter. And she just put the basics in there and some citations about Kratom, but I've since added some synthetic marijuana um, citations and um, Cynthia and Joanne made some edits and comments as well. Thank you, I appreciate that. So the letter is almost done. I feel I'll be ready to send it out early next week and just see what we get for a response. Donna Bowman, it, you know, who is, um, kind of our lead inspector, really has a good pulse on the products in our stores right now. Um, so I want to assess what that looks like a week or two weeks later after the letter goes out, make sure that she has conversations about the letter and educate them why it is we're asking what we are asking and, and then reevaluate. Um, but besides South Hadley and Belchertown passing this regulation, there is a lot of movement amongst the local health departments on, you know, looking at regulation to prohibit these products. So it's happening. We're having a Pioneer Valley um, Tobacco Coalition meeting on January 25th, which is next Thursday, next Thursday, excuse me, which you're all welcome to come to. And actually, there's going to be a remote option now. It's from one to three. And I've invited Cheryl Sabara in to talk about, again, model language in tobacco regulations, but also a little bit about these designer drugs. And I also invited Andrea Crete from the Quabbin Health District um, to come in and talk about the lessons learned um, through the Belchertown public hearings about what she saw in supportive opposition and then compliance and enforcement. So if you're not able to make it, I'll bring that back to the board, but I will send that information out. So that was very helpful. Meredith, having read the letter and our approach to it, and now this information about the illegal substance, are we asking, are now we asking the vendors or the um the um merchants, the merchants retailers to please remove something that is illegal? I Shouldn't I, we be like saying, we think we might be um, leaning toward a regulation that you must remove them? Well, what's the language that we use? Let, mm -hmm. me, Let me share my screen and bring it up so everyone can see it. Sure. Sure, I think we said, please remove. I. <laughs> <laughs> it was a softball, it was definitely. I know. Well, well, because we don't have regulation yet, that was meant to be a sort of a stopgap. Um, we could, my suggestion, I don't know if Meredith wanted to take it or not, was to just say, okay, this we're planning on regulating. Just give them the warning. But maybe we're not planning. Right, so. we've taken a vote by the board, so... Yeah. We haven't had a full conversation about it. Right, right. Can you all see this? Yes. Yeah. And and I'm um, just I just I wasn't here for the last meeting, and I guess I 
missed actually looking at that video presentation for from Cheryl. So I'm going to need to do that. But um, I'm wondering, being still like the newest member on the board, you know, we did hear from somebody who who had feelings about this today and and some experience with it. And I, when when do we talk about that or? You know where where does that play into all this? I guess is my question as well. So now is a great opportunity to talk about that. Um, also, if we were to move forward and have regulations, there would be a board of health discussion embedded into the public hearing. So another opportunity to talk about it freely. So at the public hearing, we would hear from people who have differing opinions, perhaps. Janet, just to kind of, because you are new, um, when we look at adopting a new regulation or amending a regulation, typically what we do is we have, we have a really good process in place. You know, we'll draft something, we'll get it out to, to the people that it may affect. So we would send it all to, to all the merchants. We'd put a um, something in the newspaper so the public is aware of it. And then we usually hold a public forum where people can come and speak freely. So the merchants will come and talk about how it may affect their business or their thoughts or people who use, you know, whoever it may affect. We can have an open dialogue because during our hearings, people can speak and provide public comment, but we can't respond back. So this forum, this open forum really is an opportunity to have conversations. But then when do we discuss what they have presented to us? You, we put it on agenda. Okay. So I think this uh, letter could use a little work. Um, I, I think it's not clear from this letter that you say that, you know, Delta 8 and Delta 10 are illegal. Um, Additionally, many of these products are illegal. That's just too vague. Um, so I think this the letter could be tightened up a bit. Um, um, Kratom is specified, and then there's and synthetic drugs, and I'm not sure anyone can interpret this in such a vague, or generalized term. Yeah. Um, Especially if we're asking them to do something with their inventory. It's hard to capture what yep. all of those drugs, designer drugs are. Yep. So trying to find terminology and then maybe have a definition of what that <laughs> that actually means. It, it's very yeah. difficult. I, unfortunately, I think this is always going to be a game of whack-a-mole mm -hmm. because um, um, the people who create these substances will always be at least many steps ahead yeah. of government's ability to respond. <clears throat> I think this is why in, in many cases it it has been recommended, um, not, I, I'm speaking against what I just said, but sp specifically itemize what you're talking about because that will change very quickly and they'll change a molecule here and a molecule there and then it's a different substance mm -hmm. so there uh, i let me see if i can find some language that that i remember used at one point that was recommended for um situations like this when you can never specify exactly what they are in a in a manner that actually captures all of them mm -hmm. that'd be wonderful thank you i'll, I'll try to see Cheryl has mentioned to us that anything that is a food product that has any of these products in them, buy them and then contact the food protection program. Like it's adulterated food. They cannot be for sale. They should be regulating this. She is, I mean, she's sent a hundred products to them and said, you need to do something about this. It, it's unfortunate that it always found, falls on local health departments. She sends them to them. Who is them? Uh, the, the merchants? 
uh, DPH Food Protection Program. Oh, that, oh, to, to DPH Food Protection. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but I guess what you're saying is they're not out in front on this. No. Okay. I think Cheryl Sabaro might be able to help us with the language. I mean, the, the yep. drugs that she mentioned in that video, I think were Delta 8, 10, 22, and 88 or 80 something. Um, but I think Delta 8 and 10 are the most common things that are found. Um, the only thing is Delta 9, so it almost be benefit us to just... <laughs> Anything not that's not Delta 9. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Delta 9 is controlled by somebody else. Yeah. I, 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 I'm thinking about the audience for this. Um, and I'm not sure that that's an effective message for the merchants. No, but, I know. Um, but it would it would be more in line with current law. Mm -hmm. It almost seems as if the Cannabis Control Commission needs to be doing something about this. This is THC, mm -hmm. its finest form. So either, I, I'm, I'm surprised that the legal marijuana retailers are not doing something about this because I feel like it very much, you know, is competitive with what they're doing. So the article that um, Joanne sent us today did, did mention that, that they're starting to... <laughs> Oh really? Yeah, that uh, you know because because if it's derived from hemp, I guess it they can seem to work you know work their way around it when there's all these regulations for you know for the legal stuff. So yeah, that they're yeah that they're they're feeling they're starting to feel the competition kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I also think that the dispensaries, you have to be 21 and over and you don't to go into you right. know, the, the mark. Right. And so they're really looking at, they're not, yes, they're capturing some people that are over 21, but they're capturing everyone under 21 because they can't get in the dispensaries anyways. And they're marketing. I mean, yeah. gummies, these are like, cereal boxes they look like they're marketing towards the youth we are seeing exactly what happened with jewel with these products in our convenience stores can't hear you cynthia I'm sorry can you hear me yeah um meredith you mentioned the inspector i forgot her name uh, has a good uh -huh. relationship or has I mean, are we taking an inventory of where this is happening? That might be good research for us. So we while, do. We do have, we ponder the letter. Yeah, Amy can speak to this more, but we do keep a list when they go out. Part they do check, you know, not only for tobacco, but are they selling these designer drugs, for lack of a better word? And they might itemize a little bit in that list as well. Aim. Yeah, they, they do. There's a spreadsheet. She, uh, anytime Donna sees it, she adds it to it, it you know, um, a little generalized, but, that, you know, a list sometimes. Um, but for all all of our, our stores, what they're what she's regularly inspecting and then also what she sees. Right. And they're not just in the stores that we permanent inspect. And so, I mean, there are stores selling these products that we don't go into as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering about cornucopia. I, I'm not sure offhand. I can't answer that, Janet, but I'm sure there are products in there. That's the one in Thorns, correct? Mm -hmm. So when we asked everyone to take hemp off their shelves, they were <laughs> our problem child and went on NPR. <laughs> oh, they did? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I can only imagine what's in there, but. Right. Well, I was wondering because I, I, I assume they don't sell tobacco. So oh. I didn't, I didn't know if, if, you know, they were covered in going in and seeing what's on their shelves. But they have food. So we go in there and inspect anyways. I see. Um, 
so how do you want to proceed? Um, if you will all send me, I'll send this letter out to you. And if you want to send me individually comments on the letter, what you'd like to see in it. Um, I was researching today after Joanne, I um, gave both you and Cynthia um, access to the letter um, references for uh, synthetic THC. I want to make sure we have proper citations there. Kara had let me know that some of Belchertown, uh, Belchertown citations didn't work, the links to them, so she is rechecking all of those. Um, but I'd really like to get this out sooner than later. And then at our March meeting, discuss how we'd like to move forward. I feel like, you know, we're kind of, we've always been known as the pioneers. And when someone mentioned that South Hadley was the pioneer, I was like, oh, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little hurt. <laughs> So um, I'd like to move forward doing something. And as, as Amy mentioned, you know, at a minimum, if the board isn't ready to prohibit Kratom, at least we put a minimum legal sales age on it, like tobacco. You need to be 21 or 26 is, you know, what we have for more evidence-based reasoning around the developing brain. Um, just things to think about. But I think they have a place behind the counter where people can't take it themselves. Right. Have to ask for it if we could mimic a lot what we do in our tobacco regulation, sales regulation, that would be great. So because of open meeting law, we can't actually uh, share like a Google Doc. Um, so Meredith will have to send out the letter and you send comments directly back to Meredith. Mm -hmm. And I think, Joanne, and stop me if this is an open meeting law thing, but can we say at this point in time that um, we want to move forward with some kind of a policy on these products? That's for us to decide. Yeah. I, I, it, I love the temperature check. Yeah. Can we decide it or take a temperature tonight? Um, yeah. Do, do we want to go around? Anyone want to talk about where? where they stand? I'm just comfortable saying, I think we need a policy to regulate, whether it be at the 21 and under, whatever, but I'm not ready to, until we see all the res till we see some more research. Anybody else? I support that. Look. I'd really like to hear what happened in Belchertown and South Hadley to, to learn from their experience. Um, I, I don't feel like I have enough data right now to understand what specifically the um, policy would be. I, I would be supportive, but would love a little more information too. I think uh, for me, it'd be pretty, um, I'd be supportive of uh, definitely a 21 and over policy and then Further than that, I guess I feel like I need more information. And I'm not necessarily sure we need to include um, synthetic THC. They are illegal products. I mean, if we if we brought in our police partners, I've had conversations with Jody and let them know who's selling. They could purchase the drug, test the drug, and then they can compensate and move, you know confiscate it and move forward. Um, but Would it test positive for THC. If it was a synthetic different delta? Yes. You think it would? Compounds. It's like a a, a, a molecular compound change, but I still think I'm almost 99.9% .9 positive it comes positive for THC. Okay. Suzanne might know. So that's why I you're don't. focusing on Kratom because that's the one where it's sort of fuzzy. It's, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's a lot of support and opposition uh, on Kratom right now. I actually do know someone I could ask that question of, but about the different um, deltas. Okay. We actually just, I sent this to Amy probably at uh, five o'clock tonight. Cooper's Corner um in Florence has recently changed ownership that we found out but anyways 
um, someone had let me know that they're having a um, a THC tonic water tasting tomorrow. <laughs> I know oh, you made my day I know and I, I'll just send this flyer to you because you will be floored about the information on this flyer about the company who is selling this product and now Cooper's Connor has bought into having a tasting are you going to send Donna out before or after <laughs> I'm like what are we doing about this this is not happening in our town <laughs> Wow. Five percent um tonic water, THC tonic water. But they're like, if you're a novice, only have one to two in a half an hour period. But if you're a regular THC user, like I how about just calling the old cannabis commission? <laughs> well, that was done already, but that but they're not gonna come out tomorrow and do anything about it. Uh, Cooper's Corner, which was the very first store to go tobacco free voluntarily in town. Wow. It's not the same owner, Rich. No, it's not the same owner. He retired. Old. Yeah, he retired, which is very sad. Mm -hmm. I think the employees now own um, State Street. Oh, that's great. I, I think his manager is now the, the lead. Um, yeah, I think it's the same folks. Do we know that? I, I believe so. Okay. Meredith, can't you um, send a food inspector out there? I mean, wouldn't that solve that? So again, Joanne, this is a little gray area. I mean, the Cannabis Control Commission regulates THC, not the local health department or the DHHS. Even if it's in food? Even if it's in food, they have taken that power away from us. But you have a company name that has advertised um, a presence in at least Florence. So, I mean, that's something to trace. Yes. And it's above like the, the I forget what the limit is, 0 0.03 THC, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. So, right. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of products that have that in it, mm -hmm. but this clearly is above that limit and they're they're gonna have a tasting tomorrow. I'll bet they are. So we're going to, I asked Amy, um, we'll talk about it in the morning, probably bringing a detective with us, but hopefully a call tomorrow morning saying, hey, you know, this is illegal, might just stop that from happening. <laughs> but we have other issues also at Cooper's Corner as well, so. Good times to take in. I know Dallas is going to be over there. <laughs> <laughs> now, now there's I work right across the street. The street. <laughs> 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 or tomorrow between what time one and three <laughs> going they, they can't they have the kids taste it right or what's to prevent it right i don't believe it said you have to be this, this is just a general store i don't think there's any and actually kids from jfk walk through florence yeah it's insane like this really wasn't thought out <laughs> We must have young young management. Although it's not on Thursday, and the kids from JFK love to get the buffalo chicken wrap. I was just going to say that. <laughs> I'd love to hear in an email later on what, what occurs. <laughs> you can send that out. So I'll send you the flyer tomorrow morning, and then, yeah, I'll let you know. I'll update what we did and then what actually happened. I think WWLP would like to know about this. Hi. Well, part part of me is like, I don't want to advertise it too much because if right. nothing happens, right, people are going to flock to it. So it's that real, you know, happy right. medium on what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's our plan, Meredith? You're going to send those letters to each of us. We'll give you feedback on the letters. Yeah. Um, and that's asking for voluntary voluntarily for those stores to take them off the shelves. Um, and then we will think about um, what kind of legislation we would want to work on. Local regulation, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That's Joanne, it. when you said, what's our plan, I thought you were talking about tomorrow. <laughs> what's our plan for tomorrow? We're all going to meet there. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Um, quick update. Um, Amy, you're still here. Uh, thanks for hanging in. Um, Absolutely. Just a quick update on the ventilation task force. I'll be right back. Can do. So um, I think you all know what the Ventilation Task Force did in collaboration with the Downtown Northampton Association, um, was awarded uh, some grant funding for our indoor dining venues, bars, and indoor event venues. Um, it's been a long project that we've worked together uh, with education and um, putting together packages and, and PowerPoints. And uh, we finally put together a packet that included a business cover letter with an application, uh, some, some guidance on how do you figure out what's right for you for your ventilation or filtration and some recommendations for some air purifiers. That's finally with lots of little details going on in the background um, went out through email and um, also through the mail uh, late in December, around December 21st for one and um, then on the 26th. Also on that application, there was also a link to also being able to do it online. That was our, our first push out. Since then we've done, we, we tried to advertise through the Gazette, pretty cost prohibitive, but we were able to get a, a press release in the, what they call it their, um, what do they call it? Oh, in their city segment uh, piece. And we put it on our website, it's on the front page, it's revolving all with links that they can they can uh, you know, reach out and do contact information for it. Lisa Levesque is in the office um, to answer questions. Um, slow to come in, we got our first one last week and that came, I believe, I think it came through the mail and then the next one in an email and the next one at the window and the next one at on Google Forms. So just starting to come in. Um, we still have a little bit of advertising to do. I back and forth with uh, Jillian Duclos a little bit. Um, she had, uh, we had talked about her pushing it out through Downtown Northampton Association and also uh, through the Chamber of Commerce. So we're just, you know, working that out. We, we kind of slowly rolled it out. Maybe that's good because it's a reminder and they were really busy in December. Not really sure. Um, we know they're busy. Um, a, a couple of others, Kelly Hughes has it now and is going to get it up on our social media as well, like a push out there. I think we're at the time that the task force should meet again. Our, our um, time where our deadline is uh, January 31st. So we might wanna consider pushing that back and maybe another push out through an email blast. It's been extended. Um, that's one of my thoughts. And also we, oh, I have the inspectors. They, they inspect, um, all kinds of FSCs, but not all are eligible. So when they do go out and do an inspection, I have like a little flyer type um, advertisement for it that they've been including in their inspections. But I'm wondering if I can see, you know, what time is available maybe next week, if, if we can meet and we were gonna, you know, extend that time, if maybe I could get a little public health ambassador help to maybe hand deliver, you know, right, right to them as like the last ditch, you know, here we are. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, yeah, this whole process took a lot longer than we thought. It basically took a year from last January uh, when we sort of found out about this award uh to figuring out how the money was going to flow and uh getting our materials together and so now our deadlines and all the dates that we had set up were way off so yeah, yeah let's meet um next week and we'll just fix those things we have to let the city know about that as well right if right we right I talked a little bit to Jillian about that. She is doing our reporting. You know, I, I, I reminded her how we were tracking. <laughs> we don't have heavy traffic flow yet, but we are doing it the way uh, that way that we, you know, I think are obligated to do that. But yeah, I, I think it's it's time for a meeting and just regroup and change timelines and push it back yeah. out there. Right, right. Great. Well, you've done a great job. I know it's a lot of work to get those packets ready with all kinds of information and keep updating them. And yeah, 
yeah. lots of moving parts, but it's a lot. It works. It works. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, Meredith, anything else you want to tell us? No, I think we've covered it all. So <laughs> I don't want to keep you past eight. So if you want to move on to the minutes and then close and maybe talk about the schedule. I don't know if you heard back from the board members. About the yeah. Schedule. Um, yeah, there were lots of dates where one person couldn't come, but there were no dates where two or more people couldn't come. That's great. Well, if that means that we want to keep them, keep those dates. Um, there were several dates where Dallas had um, conflicts. Um, I mean, everybody had like one conflict. Um, so I don't know if um, I think maybe. Um, uh, Uh, maybe I could put out again notices about some options for uh, some of those um, for some of those dates. Um, I think tentatively, let's keep uh, March twenty first for our next meeting. Um, but I'll um, see if we can come up with other um, other options. I'll send that by email. Just to, just to clarify, there is no February meeting. Yeah, I'm going to be away, and yeah, unless there's I something do. really pressing, okay. um, I thought it makes sense to cancel. Thank you. Can I add my two cents, Joanne? Sure. I think keeping to our schedule as much as uh, as much as possible is super important um, for just to make sure that I mean the public knows the third Thursday of the month. We've been doing this for you know decades. That's our board of health meeting. Um, when I try scheduling things with my staff, they know it's the third Thursday of the month. For, so, so for continuity purposes, as much as possible, I would advocate to keeping to the schedule as much as possible. I think the good thing is that we record all the meetings now. We can send them out afterwards to all the board members so they can catch up. If we were going to have something that we were um, required to vote, maybe we can then look at, at an alternative date. But if it's just kind of updating and moving things forward, I would, I would again, strongly recommend we try to stick to the schedule as best as possible. Um, and there was a date in October where you were not going to be able to be present and it's hard to have a meeting without you. It's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> no service. <laughs> All right, well, we'll talk about that. We have some time till that happens. Um, Dallas and Cynthia both have comments they'd like to make. Okay, Dallas. I just wanted to say, I know that there's three dates I put out there, but I can, uh, given if we do every third Thursday and there's no flexibility, I can try my hardest to make sure I can make that just one date. So. Okay, okay. Cynthia. I just I'm just a little concerned about not having the February meeting, uh, not having the February meeting, and we're not, um, and we have this letter, so the letter will still go out, right? We don't have to wait for the February meeting. Just want to make sure. If yeah. you if you guys want to have the February meeting, and Cynthia, if you wanted to chair it, um, you can have a February meeting. I'm just not going to be there. I won't be there either. So. Okay. You're okay so, to I saw Meredith nodding. The letter is going to go out in some mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I'll wait to have all of your comments. I'll wait until um, Monday of next week. And then by Wednesday, I'm hoping to have it out. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, quick look at the minutes. Yeah. Uh, I I actually, I'm, you know, I wasn't sure if I was muted or not. I wasn't at the meeting, but I noticed that in, on number five, motion approved, it said all were in favor and it showed four to zero, but there were only three people at the meeting from what I could tell. So I just want let to. Me, uh, let me share it. Hold on. Yeah. Uh. I think you're right, Janet. 
Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, so that's under number five. So here it says all favor three, zero and number one <laughs> and number five. Okay, that's a th changing that to a three. Kelly, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, anything else in the minutes? I just have a question. It says under number three, discussion, uh, at the very end about uh, after attorney Sh Cheryl Sabaro in a video that she watched, it is unprecedented to have <laughs> boards of health regulating these substances. I mean, I was there and I, I don't remember the context of unprecedented unprecedented in what way um it's, it's probably not important for the, the minutes but i it, it's unprecedented in that boards of health are out out ahead on this i think that it hasn't happened yet in massachusetts okay that, there's I, been no precedent like a legal word there's no precedent on, right no okay it's it's it, I just had a question about it. There's nothing to change as far as I can see. Anybody else? And just to add, I think um, when I was doing my research, the state of Ohio a few years ago um, prohibits Kratom, the sale of Kratom. Hmm. I've read that. Any information? If you're doing research, if you find anything interesting, um, send it my way as well. Do you know if there's any move at the state level to do anything? No, God, no. It's going to be like tobacco all over again. It'll take, uh, there's 351 communities. It'll take 245 to regulate before they do something at the state. So the minutes do say that, um, that Meredith, you were going to talk to Attorney Seawald about it. Oh, um, <laughs> I didn't. Where do you see, um just look yeah. up. Right in that same discussion part, the last paragraph. That's part of number three. I will, but he'll just tell me to go ahead. Um, but I'll send <laughs> it to him. Okay. Well, and this letter that we're we're proposing is really a, a voluntary thing. It's not really regulation, so we're not there yet. Okay. Um, anyone make want to make a motion about the minutes? Uh, move to approve the minutes as amended. Second. Any discussion? Oops. How do I unshare? You did. You're good. Well, my screen still has it on there. Let's see how we get it off there. Okay. Um, any discussion or questions? All in favor of um, those minutes from November as amended? Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. <laughs> Dallas? Uh, I cannot vote. I was not there. Okay. And Janet, you weren't there. Same. Okay. Um, and Joanne, yes. So that passes by three out of three who were in, in attendance. Um, great. Anything else before we close? I just wanna give a great big shout out to my staff who attended tonight and who stayed on. Thank you so much. And to the board for your support. Oh, thank you. Thank you, they're great thank presentations and we thank appreciate you. it. Thank you everybody, all your hard work. Stay yeah. healthy. Okay, so Meredith, we will hear from you and uh, we will meet again on March 21st. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? Um, uh, we'll move to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Suzanne? Yes. In favor? <laughs> Cynthia? Yes. yes. Janet? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Great. Thank you all. <laughs>